We'd been driving for hours, heading generally southwest towards the refugee camp. In chatting with the boys about our respective stories, I got the impression we'd all been thinking the same way. Survive, regroup, rebuild. And like my thought process, that involved just trying to figure out what happened to everybody else and then heading to where exiles go. And that location, in all our minds, had been the refugee camp. The terrain was inhospitable, the weather harsh, and the quality of life appeared to be just wretched. It was perfect for us. Wax and Hotmail didn't know what had happened to me, but they were confident I'd made it. Tier 1 guys don't last long if they're inherently pessimistic. I found out I'd had a little bit more excitement than they did. Wax just went up river until he couldn't hear gunfire anymore, sunk the boat, and went dark. He made his way cautiously to his own blowout cache that night and put some essentials together before returning to the safe house. He'd been able to scavenge some food and unlike me, hadn't forgotten to grab some life-saving water. Hotmail bailed out in one of the Unidad MRAPs and was just a little too visible for his liking, so he dumped it as quickly as he could. He got himself within a few kilometers of his cache and moved back into the hot zone like us, hoping to get some sense of what had happened before determining his path forward. He and Wax actually passed each other on the street that evening while they were individually casing out the safe house. A stroke of really good luck we all agreed we'd earned over the last couple of days. Together, with enough gear to stand up for ourselves in the event of another surprise, the mood was a blend of optimism with an undercurrent of confusion. None of us could put a finger on what had happened yet, but as far as BLT being involved or not, we were highly dubious. For a guy who spent all of his downtime drowning himself in booze, there was no way he'd have been able to hold it together that long without setting off at least one of our mental tripwires. Someone would have picked up on it. If we ever did find him, we agreed the booze issue needed to be addressed. It hadn't ever impacted a mission, otherwise there'd have been a clear cause to have an intervention moment. But we all knew it was a problem. And... And I had to own that one. I admitted I'd let it go on too long, and I told the guys I would make a move on it if or when the time came. It, it was complicated, but if I didn't do it, someone else was going to, and this was really going to bring my ability to lead into question, if it wasn't already. We were all similarly experienced and qualified on our own teams, with me being the lead mostly on account of something practically irrelevant to the operating context of our mission, namely the experience I'd gained in the region back in 2015. Everything, including the government and the resident criminal infrastructure, had changed since then, so I was learning the new landscape just like everyone else. When we eventually came around the corner and saw the fireball on the road in front of us, we were all a bit surprised. Most of the vehicles in the middle of the inferno were MRAPs. 
There were rebels, organization thugs, Unidad troops, all of them just laying all over the place. Some blown to pieces and others just drilled in the head with their brains exposed to open air. I mean, what the fuck over? What had happened here? There's no doubt someone with some skills had made a move. An ambush, an opportunistic assault, an arrest gone wrong, organization infighting. It was impossible for us to tell. Wax noticed a modified armored truck we'd seen political prisoners ferried around in parked up a side road on the left a little bit. I used the term political loosely since the lines between organized crime and politics was pretty obscure. These trucks were based on a three-ton chassis and built up to repel small arms fire prevalent in a country where the guy with the most guns is king. Basically, these trucks were used to move high-value prisoners, money, or drugs. But why was one here? Why, of all the vehicles that could be sitting here on the periphery of this incident intact, is that the one that's sitting here? Is this just a coincidence? I mean, correlation, causation, and all that? It doesn't mean anything, unless it does. We were quietly watching from a few cars back when Hotmail noticed they were loading someone in the back, and not in a nice way. If it just so happened to be someone involved in this carnage, the fact they were still alive was extremely interesting, and they were probably not looking forward to a bright future. BLT? I blurted that out loud enough to give that possibility a toehold in the center of our universe. I couldn't tell what the silence that followed represented in the form of action. Hotmail and Wax were definitely processing, and I needed to let that play out before I pushed it any further. I wanted to look over at Hotmail and Wax. Yes? No? Come on, guys. Give me something. But we'd just be guessing. I couldn't help but reflect on a conversation I'd had with Lieutenant Colonel Pete Blaber, one of the D-boys I'd talked to in Afghanistan back in the day about his whole saturate, incubate, isolate thought process. He actually writes about it in his book, The Mission, The Men, and Me. But the short version is you need to let the information bounce around in your brain for a little while before it will pick out relevant, actionable patterns. I had tremendous respect for him as a leader and applied a lot of his techniques. I looked up to him and I had a lot of reasons why. The fact that he gave his guys time to think and develop the situation was among them. We sat tight and watched as a couple of organization thugs mounted up. What the fuck is going on here? I'm no scientist, but I've always been a fan of the scientific method of fuck around and find out. Develop a hypothesis, test it, confirm it or disprove it and act on it or move on. We didn't have access to drones, signal intelligence, insider information or local resources, but what we did have was three dudes who knew a thing or two about doing surveillance. Unfortunately, none of us were going to fit in on the street like we used to be able to in Afghanistan, where you could just throw on a burqa or a niqab and some comfortable shoes and get on with it. Staying out of sight was going to be the keystone of our success. While we were sitting there talking about this in the van, the truck jolted forward and continued up the hill towards a very large church complex we could see just over the visible horizon. Hotmail mentioned there was a detention center of some sort up there, but hadn't had any direct exposure to it. Wax had nothing either, so until we did something about it, we were in the dark. So, let's do something about it. We turned up the road a few hundred meters behind the truck and I followed at a safe distance. The truck pulled off at a checkpoint that headed deeper into the facility while the driver and some other goon exchanged pleasantries. We drove past, trying to look as inconspicuous as possible and then did a quick recce on the immediate area. There was some high ground, but it may be heavily patrolled or booby-trapped. We were going to need to stagger our approach and monitor the area before we committed to do our surveillance. This takes time, which may or may not have been on our side, but throwing our lives away at this point on an uncertainty wasn't the answer. We agreed to set up three observation posts that looked into the area we wanted to be when things got dark. We all had nods and basic radios in our tickle trunks and did a little map study as we waited for the sun to go down. When we were certain nobody was going to see us slink into position, we split up and headed to our respective OPs. Wax, being a sniper, took a position that overlooked us since he had some longer ranged optics. Hotmail and I worked north and south of the facility. 
We watched and waited for a couple of hours before we saw that there was no evidence of any patrols. We didn't discount the possibility of booby traps, but in my previous experience, I didn't find that they had been very widely used in the region. Actually, sorry, cancel that. They had been used for a time, but resulted in killing so many of their own guys, they fell into disuse. This is one of the major disadvantages to having a transient workforce with a high attrition rate. Right when you think you've told all of your people where the IEDs are placed, somebody else shows up. We had a good view of most of the facility, but there were a few blind spots. One of the critical shortcomings of our vantage point was we couldn't see a cell block of any kind. We were pretty sure we knew where it was. It was up in a blind spot up against the wall between us and happened to be the area of highest patrol frequency. All the guys walking around with guns rotated in and out of that one area. There were feds, my unidad, thugs and rebels milling around, all with money falling out of their pockets. This was very, very clearly an organization stronghold. There's no doubt whoever it was in there had pissed them off or were a person of interest. BLT fits squarely in those two categories. I mean, if he'd just blown up all their stuff, which he very well could have, then he'd be in trouble. But they'd keep him alive to see if he'd squawk on us. It doesn't take much to make someone incredibly uncomfortable, and you only have two balls, so it doesn't take long to figure out they both taste the same. We watched for patrol patterns inside and outside the walls. The patrol schedule seemed like someone would go by about whenever they felt like it, and this was very difficult to prepare for. After four hours of monitoring, we agreed it was time to pinch into our second stage OPs in a similar 1 over 2 configuration. There was at least one drunk dude in there who was living in the past, singing the old Santa Blanca anthem. I got a really good idea where he was hanging out, and that became our focal point of entry. We did agree on a set of immediate action conditions in the event something big happened, but unless that happened, we took our time to polish the cannonball in our preparations. 3 to 4 a.m. is when the body is at its weakest, even if you train for it. This becomes a very common exploitation window within military circles. If you're going to get attacked, it's very likely going to be around then, and you prepare for it. If you're in a non-combat stance, then no preparations are made. Were we going to wait and see if they were prepared for that 3 a.m. window and then advance the following night? Or did we simply roll the clock forward and hit an hour earlier tonight? I put that over the net. Where do you guys land on this? And there wasn't any discussion on it. We execute at 2 a.m. Wax will overwatch with his M40A5. I'm number one with my tricked out Mark 18. Hotmail number two with his deck 416. We stacked on our entry point at 0155. Breathe. In for four, hold for four, out for four, empty for four. Cycle after cycle. Keep that vasculature to the brain open. Wax cleared us in at 0200 and we moved over the wall. He had a good position to see us as we moved in the direction we believed would take us to the cell block. We didn't want to burn anyone down. If we could keep our rounds in the chamber, we would. We're not in the killing business. We're in the doing business. And we wanted to bring as little attention to the fact that we were still alive as possible. If we just ceased to exist in Bolivia, there was a good chance that whoever was after us would grow tired of looking, so we conducted ourselves accordingly. I reached the last corner and held up before we went into the unknown. I was confident the cell block was right there, but Wax couldn't confirm nor deny that any guards were in there waiting. Fuck, we didn't even know if who we were looking for was actually in there. We hadn't put eyes on them the whole time. But I felt the squeeze on my left arm, and that meant time to go. 
I was a little relieved to see there was a row of cells on the wall and only one was occupied by someone laying on the floor facing in the other direction. I moved over to the cell wall, staring in, hotmail facing the rear covering the back half. I announced that we had contact over my headset and the figure in front of me shifted, then rolled over slowly to face me. I was surprised at what I saw, but not nearly as surprised as what I heard. Hey, puke. Took you so long.